So in part one, we talked about the uh, uh, just general processes and how they kicked it off. I did tell you to take a look at ETL now. There's a whole different kind of process as well. In this specific example, the wheelhouse that they're focusing on is actually ERP, so enterprise resource planning. ETL is, is one side of it and then and sort of like the day really the differences between these things are where the data comes in and how it's planned okay so etl stands for extract transform load and then erp is just enterprise resource planning there's also like mrp and some other stuff but generally the idea is there's some some data is presented um at different parts of this pipeline it'll be either loaded or planned and then sort of you know move down the chain from there that's the idea now in this particular example um they're direct competitors in terms of what they're offering as an erp platform are things like oracle like sap workday infor um i think netsuite but that's that's oracle so um, microsoft has one called dynamics yeah so just keep those as competitors you know uh uh i won't waste much of your time let's get back into the video right where we left off so um, talking about software defined data integration for the last uh, few weeks, we've been running a, a blog series. Sorry, just last thing, this software defined blah, blah, blah. So he's saying software defined data integration. Anything software defined is the future guys. Okay. So everything that I do is software defined infrastructure, software defined networking. Uh, basically all that is is before, right? Just to, I don't, I don't want to keep stopping, but before um, you would actually have to go into something, click a few things, and then it'll deploy like for for example if you want to deploy like a cluster of virtual machines to host like a website or something um or an application you would actually have to go and specify that right um now you just write some code and it goes out and it's done right so that's software defined software defined networking so if you want to have like a uh, an entire like network where you have your switches your your uh, routers and all this stuff that's going to do the networking so the ip traffic and all that stuff right uh, there's software defined stuff where you can just write software and it goes and does that automatically so that's that's very very fast um very few companies have that down very very few i'll be honest with you very few uh, most people still hire like folks that essentially go in and actually press buttons so keep that in mind that's a very big thing um and uh you know if you've if you've read any of that um do let us know what you thought of it uh, in the in the comments on the on the live stream but um the first of those posts uh included our four guiding philosophies uh which we kind of came up with as we were really thinking about what we mean by software defined data integration which powers palantir hyper auto so to talk to us um colin could talk us through the first of those um philosophies give it to me Come cool on. yeah so um the first and foremost guiding uh principle behind uh palantir hyper auto is integrating data uh from first principle um the most uh, flexible as well as the richest application layer needs the most granular uh, data access backing behind. Um, oftentimes, okay. we see at different companies, their application layer is being powered by pre-processed aggregated data sets. Uh, this becomes a problem because it is almost impossible uh, to know in the future what are all the potential questions that your users might want to ask from the data sets. Um, so it was a common pattern that we see this is the stuff I was telling you guys. So pre-processed data sets is really just like, you have so many different like typeset versions of schemas where it's like, they're, they're, it's like they have a specific data coming from here, specific data coming from here. So when it actually finally comes together, it's like it's just a big jumble, right? So it's very ambiguous and it's very tough to take that and actually make it human readable to do future growth for whatever company that you're part of. So just think about that. If a company has multiple applications then you have multiple ways to read that data, right? It's like taking like a book, like, you know, if you, if you have, uh, you know, like three different books, but they all sort of talk about similar things, they all do it in different ways. So you have to like find a way to, you know, find the commonality between those books and that, then you'll get the context for all three. Anyway. See at many different companies, essentially the users go back to their IT counterparts and then ask for the pre-processed aggregated data sets um, to be regenerated. <laughs> Uh, and with Palantir um, Hyper Auto, because we integrate data via first. Sorry, I, I keep stopping, but it's actually funny because it's true. Like whenever these analytic teams come, uh, you know, whenever it comes down to the point where they have to do reporting, they always go to the IT teams and they're like, please just regenerate like four months worth of data. And then like, it's like, dude, that's going to take like a week, <laughs> right? So it's, 
um, you know, it's not as it's not as simple as that. But uh, once you do that, there's that whole layer, of, like I was telling you about the whole analysis and and putting stuff together and making it actually make sense. Part so, and I already feel there's going to be a long one, but you know, whatever. Principle: We always enable our partners to pull the data from the most granular level, and by doing so, it guarantees mm. the most flexible application layer, so that uh, we always have guarantee that in the future when there is a new questions comes up your data assets can be uh sufficient to answer those questions okay thanks okay. Colin. that's it that's assuming that so it's consistent second um principle that we have is to automate as much as possible uh now that on the surface of it sounds quite obvious but um Duh. i think that while a large number of things have been automated and certainly a lot of business processes have been automated the actual building of data pipelines remains something which in a lot of cases is still quite a manual uh, task. And while when you think about it um, and you look at data integration problems, um, some of those are truly unique and they require manual effort to really think about and build the pipeline to solve. Yeah, the so bad. A lot of data integration problems are of a similar shape, not an identical shape, but of a similar shape. Now, if they were of identical shapes, then you could think about essentially writing a template. You could define your data pipeline to say, I am going to work with these 10 tables and I'm going to process them in such a way to produce this output. And that would be great. And you could pick that up um, wholesale, move it across to another system of the same shape and solve the problem again. But in reality, that's not how things work, right? You look at um, an ERP system and from one uh, company to the next, they might have different versions, which will mean slightly different things about the structure of the data. Or someone might have implemented their CRM system slightly differently, introducing custom fields or custom tables. So taking that sort of cookie cutter approach isn't going to work there. And that's, that's where the automation comes in. With Palantir Hyper Auto, we're dynamically introspecting the structure of the data. And that is how we empower this automation of building the pipeline, which will work and will and will keep pace with okay. any of those changes okay. that we see from one place to the next. Cool. Um, so going to the third principle, which goes very nicely uh, with our second one, is essentially build an extensible knowledge framework. So as Tom mentioned, the second guiding principle is to automate as much as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's quite obvious that you can't automate everything, right? Um, so from our experience, uh, we learned that there are learnings, knowledge about source system or business operation that just can't be automated away. Uh, but yeah, it is super true. valuable to be able to uh, encapsulate that in product because such learnings uh, will compound over time. Um, so okay, bearing with that okay. in mind, uh, we have built a knowledge framework extensible within Palantir Hyper Auto such that uh, our partners can contribute those knowledge into the product and then on top of that we also layer on top a vigorous review contribution framework to make sure all this contribution is maintained at a high bar and um, so by doing automation plus knowledge framework mm. we're essentially doing a perfect combination between software defined and human defined wait a minute thanks hold on a second so let's hold talk on. about the, the fourth and final um principle okay let's hear uh, this. behind Software defined integration and, and Panda High Porto, which is to close the operational loop. So we're no longer in a world where you know uh, an, an enterprise IT architecture comprises a single monolithic system. Uh, you have you have a large number we're of well different systems that, that interplay in a in a complicated ecosystem, and they all provide different benefits to different parts of the organization. You have your ERP systems. You may have many of those. You have CRM systems. Um, that work across different divisions. You then have analytical systems and tools. You have BI tools. And, you know, unfortunately, still in a lot of data architectures that we see, data flow is unidirectional. It's just going mm -hmm. from, yeah. for example, the operational systems to the analytical systems. And really, if you want to ensure that the decisions that you're making at a high level are implemented, you need to close that loop. You need to write back. So in building okay. our philosophy and then in building Palantir Hyper Auto, we've always ensured that we can close the operational loop, that we can have a first class way of writing back to a system as well as consuming from it. So uh, when I was, uh, when, okay, when okay, you first on. joined. Hold on, hold on. Okay. 
So I told you guys I'm going to try to keep it 100 with you every time. Um, the truth is they have these four principles that they're talking about. Number one and two are pretty basic. It's not like, you know, it shouldn't blow your mind. Uh, for me, that's pretty obvious. Anywhere I've worked, uh, one and two has been like the core prerogative. Have we done it right? Who knows, right? It really depends on what the company wants to take out of that. But one and two are standard. Now, number three, um, you know, I, I forget this guy's name, but he mentions that it's um, like, he just kind of like blurts it out. The thing is, that's actually very difficult. So having the business processes be human defined and actually within the system itself is actually quite difficult. This is the part of the process that's actually um, like, this is the part of the process where people actually guide this, you know, uni unilateral movement that the guy was talking about, the other guy. This is the thing that they're, they actually manually guide it, right? So you sit with an analyst um, and you say, okay, I want the data to look like this. And then they'll sort of, you know, make the schema out. All of this is kind of like a mold, okay? So think of think of like the data as like sticky tack or sticky dough or Play-Doh, sticky dough. Um, and you're basically shoving it through multiple like, you know, molds, right? So the, the business guy comes in and gives you what he, he tells you what he thinks the mold should be. And then you as an analyst makes, basically make the mold. Right. So that's that's basically this process. Um, now, this is a very manual process. So if they have found a way to put this within the software. Um, man, that's that's pretty big. That's pretty big. That's like uh, the, the reason why it's big and, it, and it's if people have tried before. The reason why it's big is because it changes all the time. Right. It changes all the time. It could be for ad, think about it for ad campaigns or whatever, like for like segmenting um categorization of of like users and all this other stuff uh, especially now with first party data coming in-house um you know cookies and stuff right like you read up on that but especially stuff like that data is actually a little more like you need to be very specific so um yeah if they found a way to put it in the software itself then the, um, the time it takes for them to change that mold is going to be so fast so you're not going to have any issues with like roadblocks in your in your whole process Second thing is he mentioned that though usually it's unilateral, right? It usually just goes from one side to another. There's a reason for that. The reason is because it's such a long and lengthy process. Like you're talking about terabytes of data, right? So long and lengthy process that you know if you if it's not unilateral, it's gonna it's gonna be a waste of time. If you keep having stops at each way, it's gonna be a waste of time. So you plan it out in the beginning and then you run through the whole pipeline. That's usually why it's like that. Um, but Point number three is very key here, guys. That stuff, um, that's what I'm looking for. The other, the other four stuff is like obvious. It's stuff that everybody does. There are systems now that do that right now. So, you know, whatever. Uh, to what degree? I'm not sure. Palantir maybe do, does it better, but I'm just trying to be honest. All right, guys, that's it. That concludes this part. Uh, I guess I'll check you out in the next one. Catch you later. Peace.